crime files, we try to select a case that uh, you'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about. Uh, some of them are murder cases, some of them are fraud cases, uh, and a lot of you like cold cases. Um, and they're interesting because there's a lot of investigation that goes into those, and many of them do get solved. So I think today's case we'd call the Deep Freeze Cold Case because I think it's the oldest cold case that I've ever worked on. I did a lot of work on it because I didn't think that we would ever be able uh, to convince a jury, at least, uh, that this individual was guilty of a double homicide. So it's an interesting case today, and I hope you will watch this. And I just want to mention we have a new episode coming out every Friday at 3 o'clock. But to be certain, uh, hit the subscribe button. If you hit it, uh, you'll be notified when our next episode uh, is available. So, let's get started with the facts of today's case. What are they? Well, what's our topic today? Run, but can't hide. The Gerald Mason case. Well, what's that all about? Well, it goes back a long ways to El Segundo, California police officers. They're on patrol, and Officer... Curtis is the driving officer and officer. Phillips is the passenger. And it's about midnight. It may have been 11.55 on July 22nd of 1957. They're driving along and they see a car go we'll speed through a red signal at uh, uh, Sepulveda and Rosecrans Boulevard. So they decided they're going to follow it and pull it over for a traffic stop. So they got behind it, uh, they had to catch up with it, eventually they caught up, but it kept driving, and they had to turn on their red lights. They turned on their red lights and followed it, got very close to it, and eventually the car did pull over on Rosecrans. And here you can see the police car uh, where it came to rest, uh, and the two officers uh, got out of the police car uh, to you know, write that traffic citation. And it was Officer Phillips who was on the passenger side. And here you can see his um, little uh, ticket book on the fender there. Uh, he's going to write a citation for going through a red light. Now, the position of the two officers, you can see. They're on both sides of the police car. Now, the person who they pulled over, who was driving and went through the red light, he's standing right in front of the police car. He's looking at the officers. He turns abruptly, and he reaches into his waistband, and he pulls a gun out, and he shoots both officers. Both Officer Phillips and Officer Curtis are mortally wounded right there next to their police car. Now, to understand this case, this map is helpful. Where the number three is, that is where the police car uh, pulled over the other car. Now the other car got away uh, after the shooting, and, but it only drove maybe three blocks and then it was abandoned. So that's that number four there. Now when they looked at the car, they noticed that it had bullet holes in the back. And what was interesting was that Officer Phillips uh, had been a sharpshooter for the Army uh, before he joined the El Segundo Police Department. Look how accurate Officer Phillips was. You can see shot directly uh, where the driver would be. Now this case is going to be easily solved because you can see the license plate number on the car right there. All we have to do is find out who is the registered owner of a car by HCM370. So, here's this homicide, a very serious homicide of two police officers uh, solved because now we know who is the owner of the... Well, it isn't quite that easy. What we find out is the registered owner as a teenager, and he was up on Lover's Lane with his girlfriend as well as another couple. And they were up there, and somebody came up, knocked on their window, robbed them, made them take off all their clothes, throw their clothes in that car, and then stole the car. So here, here's what's found in the car. You can see that corroborates exactly what these teenagers say. So the registered owner, that teenager, was not the killer of those two police officers. 
Now, just to show you the distance away that was, the uh, Lover's Lane is over there where the number one is, and this is the route that the killer would have taken after he robbed him. Yeah, there he got a Rosecrans Boulevard, and there at number two, that's where he went through the red light uh, at Sepulveda, the Rosecrans, and continued over, and that's where the police car was, and that's where the car was eventually abandoned. So that gives you kind of a perspective of what was going on. Now, how are we going to solve this case? The Sheriff's Department, the Homicide Bureau, was assigned it. Now, you know, witnesses find out what witnesses. Well, our best witnesses are our two victim police officers. They're dead. They're not going to be able to help us out. Fingerprints. Well, they were able to get some partial prints, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Ballistics. Well, they have the projectiles from the police officers' bodies, but there's no gun. There's no gun that's recovered. And DNA, is that going to help us back in 1957? No. Those were merely letters of the alphabet back then. So let's take a look at the first one, which is the latent prints. Well, we get that car, and we dust it for prints on the steering wheel, and they get prints but they're partial prints. They get two partial prints, and that's all they get, and they can't combine them. Back in those days, everything had to be done by hand, uh, and they would get a latent print, and then look at it next to maybe a, a booking uh, print card, but no match. There was no match with these partial prints. So that isn't going to help us. Now let's address the issue of ballistics. Now, we know we don't have the gun, but what happens if we did have the gun? Well, getting the gun took a little while, and these are the ingredients for the gun. Uh, gardening, coffee can, let's call the police, curious police officer, assemble the pieces of the gun, test fire the gun, compare the bullets removed from the victims. Okay, let's just go through that, and if we do have that gun, we may end up with a murder weapon. To start out with, that's where the car was found, right there. And over number five, oh, that most likely is six blocks away in Manhattan Beach. Uh, there's a house. And this is the house. The house and the people there did a lot of gardening. They gardened in their backyard, and every year they would... Uh, take the plants out uh, that were dead and put new ones in. And the residents, they found a, a watch, a wristwatch, and then they found a revolver frame in where the gardening was, then a cylinder, and some more items of a watch, and then eventually a cylinder pin. And what did they do with all these things when they found, well, as I say, the murders were in 57, and they found the watch in 57, but they didn't think anything of it. But what they did was they threw it in a coffee can in their uh, gardening shed, and then in 59, when they found some other items from a revolver, they threw them in that coffee can. And it wasn't until about 1960 that they contacted the Manhattan Beach Police Department. And they said, you know, every time we've been gardening, we're finding pieces of watches as well as a revolver. And what is interesting about this case is the Manhattan Beach police officer who came out and looked at those pieces of a gun in a coffee can started thinking, oh, what about, you know, several years ago, there were those two El Segundo police officers who were shot about five blocks away from here, and I wonder if there's any connection. Well, he then takes all those pieces over the El Segundo Police Department and gave it to them and said, hey, I don't know if, what it is. And they, the El Segundo Police Department with the Sheriff's Department, took all those pieces and put them together. Now this is what they came up with. This is the bullets, the uh, shells that were still there, and they test fired it and they compared the projectiles that were recovered from the two officers, and 
they matched. It was a perfect match. That was the gun that was used to shoot the two police officers. Wow, now we have something. Now what are we going to do with that? Well, we want to know whose, whose gun is it? Well, we want to know, is there a serial number? You know, where was it sold? You know, who bought it? Yeah, and then you know, check out the name of that person who bought it. And maybe anyone who stayed in the area. Oh, only a fake name. Wow, that doesn't look too good, but let's follow through on that. Well, they trace that gun. There's the serial number. And it comes back to a gun that was sold in Shreveport, Louisiana, just a several days before the officers were shot. And it was bought by a G.W. Wilson. And when they go back there to Sears Roebuck, uh, who sold the gun, and this was their ledger. And if you look on the ledger, it gives you all the information of the person who bought it. It talks about Miami, Florida was where that person was from. So now we have something. Shreveport, Louisiana, an address in Miami. What those detectives did back there was kind of remarkable. They are at Sears Roebuck. There it is. You can see Sears. And they went around thinking, is there any residence around here? Any hotels, motels, or something where somebody might have been staying? Because now they know the gun was bought three days before the shooting of the officers. They went to the YMCA, which you can see is uh, kind of on the same block, but on the other side of it. They went in there and asked for registration for the date uh, that the gun was purchased from Sears Roebuck. Sure, there's a registration there for a George D. Wilson. A little bit different, but it has a uh, an address in Miami. So now they are on to something. So they go to that address in Miami, Florida, and they're going, oh, it doesn't work out. It proved to be a false address. So that didn't add up. Wow, that isn't going to be helpful at all. So we have a double murder of two police officers and the case goes into the cold case files and it stays there for years and years and years for 40 years that case you know nothing came out of it no clues no nothing however technology had changed over those 40 years especially as to latent prints remember we were talking about it had to be done manually uh, as far as comparing prints. But the computer had been developed since uh, that time. And look at all the uh, computers that uh, had been developed uh, over those years. And now they could do something with partial prints. Uh, so what the Sheriff's Department did was they pulled those partial prints out and they put it in the computer. And when they put it in the computer, they could re-examine. In other words, they could take the two partials and they could make it a composite. And there it is. You see, there's the composite by comparing the two. That can only be done by a computer. So now they have something they could put through a database. Forty years later, are they likely to come up with anyone in the database that they did? The APHIS database. Oh. All that work and there's no matches. For some reason, one of the detectives said, okay, let's try some of the state databases. And they tried the South Carolina database for fingerprints and they put it through there. And there was a match and it came back to a Gerald F. Mason. Whoa, now they had something. So who was he? Who was this Gerald F. Mason? Well, he had lived in South Carolina. He had a little bit of a criminal history. He uh, had a burglary charge, and he had been released from prison seven months before the shooting of the police officers in El Segundo. 
And the other thing, as far as a residence, he generally liked to stay at the YMCA, especially back there in Columbia. Wow. Okay, so some similarities there. So we get his prints uh, from the, uh, the state prison, and we compare them up, and there's no question. Uh, those partial prints make it a positive match to that Gerald Mason. Now we're going to use forensics as to handwriting. Now what is this all about? Well, what we did have, remember I told you about at the YMCA, there was a registration card. Uh, this person, George D. Wilson, filled that card out. It was their handwriting. Now, as far as Gerald Mason, who we now know lives in South Carolina, this is his handwriting from uh, uh, DMV. He had purchased a vehicle and sold a vehicle, and this was his uh, signature and his name. So we have something to compare. Now look at that S-O-N. Look at that N, look at that. And look at the G. Look at the type of G's that he makes. So there is a similarity, and they got more handwriting, and they were able to make him on handwriting. So in other words, Gerald Mason, this is Gerald Mason, and that registration at the YMCA, and that was where at the YMCA that was in there the day of the purchase of the gun from Sears Roebuck. So here is the connection of the two. We have something. So we can connect that gun to Gerald Mason. So now we have a number of things that are going to help us make this case. And when I was involved in putting the case together for prosecution, this is what I put together to show the various uh, points of evidence that we had that pointed to Gerald Mason, even though it was 40 years earlier. Uh, so these are the various points. And his defense attorney came in and said, you know, what evidence do you have? And we said, oh, well, I put this together. And we showed this to the defense attorney. The defense attorney, well, let me take that. Let me, let me show that to the defendant. And he did. He took that, showed it to the defendant, and he pled guilty. He pled guilty to the two murders. The two murders. Now, as far as sentencing, what should be considered at time of sentencing? Here we have Gerald Mason. He's in his 80s. His daughter says, you couldn't have had a better father. He was a great family man. All of his neighbors couldn't praise him more. Whenever they needed help at any time, he was there. He was a hard-working businessman. He had several gas stations and convenience stores uh, in South Carolina. Worked very, very hard. And when he came in at the time of pleading guilty, he was very remorseful. And he apologized for what he had done 40 years earlier. His only wish, all he wanted, was if he could serve his time in South Carolina near his family. And that was part of the agreement in accepting his plea. So he was sentenced to life in prison, and he served that time in South Carolina prison. Now, what was the end? Well, this was the end. He went up for a parole in 2009, and it was denied. He did not get uh, paroled. And... Kind of sad. He was married. He had two daughters, wonderful daughters, and uh, three grandchildren. And he died of natural causes in prison in uh, 2017. Well, here was a very law abiding neighbor and a wonderful family man for 46 years. Well, what about the victims? and their families for 46 years. Well, Officer Curtis's family, uh, and this is Officer Phillips' family, those children all grew up without a father. For 46 years, they did not have a father. Was that fair to those children? Hmm, tough, tough decision. 
Now, I wanted you to see what does it look like today out there on Rosecrans Boulevard where the car was pulled over. And they're completely changed. I'm out there standing exactly where it occurred 45 years earlier. And here is where the gun was found. You know, this always fascinated me. Uh, he had thrown the gun over this wall, it was a different wall at the time, but into that backyard. And here's a picture of the front of that house. Those people are not even aware that the gun, the parts of the gun were found in their backyard 40 years earlier. So back to what we said at the beginning. Run, but can't hide. The long arm of the law will get you. Well, hopefully you found this Gerald Mason case fascinating as it was to me when I was working on it. As I told you, this is the coldest cold case I ever worked on, almost half a century. I wrote a book, um, Detectives Tracking Down Killers. If you want to know more about how detectives go about solving these cold cases, uh, get my book. It's kind of interesting if you want to know more details as to how they go about doing it. Well, hopefully you'll join us again for another True Crime Files of Los Angeles podcast when we take another case and we examine it and tell you all about it. See you then.